Hello, Flat Earth researchers, debaters, and debunkers. I'd like to introduce you to Simon Dan, who has taken it upon himself to debunk one of my Flat Earth videos, uh, specifically about tides, uh, and re-educate me uh, on how tides actually work because gravity rules, apparently. Well, let's see what he has to say. Hello and welcome along. My name is Simon Dan, and today I'm taking on a fellow Brit. Now, he is another one of these gravity deniers and he's taking up an issue with the tides. Specifically that the moon does not cause them. I think we need to re-educate him, don't we? Okay, let's get started. Hello, Flat Earth researchers, debaters and debunkers. It's low tide here in Portis Head in the southwest of England off the River Severn estuary. The difference between the low and high tides, which occur twice daily each is about five to six meters actually for porter's head it's more like nine to ten meters but hey who's counting you can see over there the difference between the low tide now and the high tide mark at the lock entrance and the boats beyond in the marina have to wait until high tide until they can be let out of the lock so this means that millions of tons of water is being shifted and we are told that this is because of the moon's gravitational pull on the earth. But the high and low tides are occurring four times a day with the moon going overhead just once a day in any given location. Right. Let's think about this logically, shall we, rather than just assume the widely accepted scientific theory is wrong. The moon takes 28 days to orbit us, so it's clear that the Earth is rotating faster than the moon is orbiting us. All right, I'll just interject there. Uh, first of all, let's have a look at the time, uh, the tide forecast for uh, Portishead, where I filmed the tide. He's right that it does occasionally reach uh, 10 meters. It's anywhere between uh, 6, 7 and 10 meters. But what we can see here is that within a 24 hour period between say Sunday and Monday we have three high tides. Uh, we can just go down here and see that for example on Sunday it is uh, going to be high tide at 10.30 and then high tide again, 10 in the evening. And then by 11, just over 24 hours later, another high tide. So that's three in 24 hours. Let's see what his explanation for tides is. If you are stood at a certain point, for example, when there is a high tide, then the moon's gravitational pull is causing that high tide. Six hours later, the Earth has rotated a quarter of a turn, so to speak, and therefore you are now standing in a spot that is a low tide. Another six hours on and you're back in a position where there's a high tide. Go forward six hours again and it's low tide. Finally, after one day, you are back where you started a high tide. There. Two. All right. Um, let's just flip that back a little bit. Why? Would there be a high tide here on the opposite side of the Earth to where the moon's gravitational pull is pulling the water this way? There's no reason for there to be a high tide on this side. So this illustration in itself doesn't really make sense. Finally, after one day, you are back where you started a high tide. There, two high tides, two low tides, one day. Um, so again, there were actually, there are usually three high tides in about a day. With all this water being shifted with so much force, how come we and other living things, which are mostly comprised of water, do not feel this force? acting on us as well. This is a matter of scale. The moon's gravity is influencing us, yes, but the effect is so immeasurably small 
we don't feel it. Gravity weakens by a factor of its distance squared. Oceans are huge. The Atlantic, for example, has an area of over 100 million square kilometres, yet the tidal range is only a few metres. The Mediterranean, which is significantly smaller than the uh, Atlantic, has tides that max out around one metre. Lakes have tides as well, but they're very, very small. All right, um, he seems to be forgetting that um, all the oceans in the world are just one big ocean. We've just named them differently because of where they are, based on their locale. So um, it's all one body of water. So every aspect of these tides defies logic. I think you'll find that when you watch this video, that the statement you just made right then is fairly embarrassing for you. Food for thought. And maybe we should be considering other theories and reasons as to why we have such a massive difference in the tides. What theories are those then? Because there are none that exist which can explain all of it. And you know that, which leads me to think that you haven't got a clue what you're talking about. You see, you don't even know what's going on in the world, yet you are so eager to dismiss what's actually happening. It beggars belief. All right, well, admittedly, none of us actually know what's going on in the world. None of us know why we're here, how we got here, who we are or where we are. So there are no theories or beliefs that are alternatives to the only way we've been taught to perceive our reality. The admission is that we simply do not know anything about our being here. And spinning balls uh, all held together with uh, the magical glue of gravity is just another creation story. Just like all the other religions have their own creation story. So yes, it beggars belief, as you say, Mr. Simon Dan. And I'd just like to take you back to this Why? footage. We have... Let's go back a bit. Now, Food for thought. I've asked Simon Dan to show me where on earth water does not flow down a curve. You can see a trickle of water coming from the lock gates here and it gently flows down this slight curve out to the water. And maybe uh, we should be considering other theories and reasons as to why we have such a massive difference in the tides. Okay, so uh, that's one question I've asked Simon Dan and he refuses to answer about how it's possible to have water not flowing down a constant curve because wherever you are on a globe then the surface is always curving away from you and down. So water will naturally flow down a curve. Where does it stop if you're on a sphere? What theories are those then? Because there are none that exist which can explain all of it. And you know that, which leads me to think that you haven't got a clue what you're talking about. You see, you don't even know what's going on in the world, yet you are so eager to dismiss what's actually happening. It beggars belief. So it's now high tide, and you can see those boats that were on the mud are now floating. You should be able to see the difference. A massive difference in the height of the water, twice daily, that surely isn't anything to do with the alleged gravitational pull 
of the moon. So I'll just add my own thoughts on this, that uh, the sun and the moon are like the hands of a clock. Uh, just like the stars, we, we make observations to tell the time. That's all we can do on this earth is tell the time. We can even predict eclipses by watching the sun and moon follow their independent paths. We don't have to be moving. Uh, I've also pointed out to Dan that uh, his uh, belief that the moon orbits the earth every 28 days is just an interpretation of what we see but if you actually look at the sun and moon each day you will see that the sun and the moon follow similar paths kind of independent from each other and uh, but the sun will overtake the moon every month and if you trace their paths for a while you can easily predict when an eclipse will occur or when their paths will cross. Uh, so this has been done for millennia, as far as we know, without having to have an, a heliocentric model to predict it. It is simply done by Earth-based observations. You don't need a spinning ball model to predict eclipses. Just like any of the other things that we uh, can predict about what we will see in the sky. He's also challenged me on retrograde motion. Uh, again, uh, it's the Copernican model uh, that insists that everything is circles, but uh, retrograde, retro, what appears to be retrograde motion is like uh, sacred geometry. Uh, we see this all the time in sunflowers and snowflakes and what have you. Yeah. So this is just, uh, it's a natural occurrence for um, things to make petal shapes or to turn back on themselves. Again, the insistence that retrograde motion of Mars, for example, is wrong is just because it doesn't fit with you know, the, Copernic, the, the idea that everyone, everything has to be circles. All right, let's just hear what he has to say, and then I'll leave a link in the description, and you can go and uh, educate him yourselves if you like. But uh, I've tried, and um, he believes that um, seeing pictures of Earth from space is enough evidence for him. So probably fighting a lost cause, but you know, at least you can try and uh, educate him. Oh look, he's come back six hours later when the Earth has rotated, caught a return enough for the tide to rise. Would you look at that? Absolute village. Okay, I'm done with this guy now. Uh, thank you all for watching as usual. Please like and subscribe. Ah, that's enough. Okay, just go and check it out if you like. Thanks a lot. Cheers.